Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those joining us from all parts of the globe. Thank you for joining this Java Container Optimization for the Cloud webinar. My name is Danny Bauer, and I'm a member of the Red Hat Partner Connect team that is hosting this event. Before we begin, we'll go over a few housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded, so after the webinar, you'll receive the recorded link that you can forward along to your coworkers. If you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the Bright Talk question field, and we'll try to answer them at the end or during the presentation um, as they come available as well. There will be three separate poll questions displayed during the webinar for you to submit your responses. They will be displayed one at a time. And you can find the presentation slides and other resources available for downloading. See the attachments tab underneath the window. So now I'd like to introduce, introduce you to today's speaker, uh, Severin Gewolf. Uh, Severin Gewolf is going to be taking over now. He's a Red Hat principal software engineer. I'll leave it with you. Thanks so much, Severin. Thank you, Danny. Uh, hi, and welcome to this talk on Java container optimization for the cloud. I am Severin Gewolf, the principal software engineer at Red Hat. I work on Red Hat's JDK team working on upstream OpenJDK and Mandrel, a Gravium distribution specifically for Quarkus use. So deploying to containers in the cloud, is it actually different? In our experience, it is. Why? When you're deploying to containers in the cloud, the application runs as PID1, and you usually have one application per container. That usually means that you have smaller JVMs overall. By small, we mean two, less than two cores and less than two gigabytes of memory. And it, the environment is also more dynamic. You are deploying to the cloud. You're deploying with a resource limit in place. And your resource limits might change during the deployment lifecycle. And the nodes underneath that actually run your containers might be different throughout the deployment lifecycle of your containers as well. So overall, a more dynamic environment than the usual uh, on-premise deployment scenario. Then when it comes to GC tuning, uh, you might want to optimize for a, a different metric. For example, in the public cloud, you have to pay attention to the cost associated with it when you're, you're paying for me memory use and CPU use. And that means you probably want to tune your um, garbage collector in a way that saves as much memory as you want, as you, as, you, as you can. Then you have to think about the base image, which you, uh, operating system are you running? The container includes part of the operating system. How do you get updates for those dependencies part in, part in the container? What JDK am I running? Does the JDK that I'm, I'm running uh, get security updates? To some extent, you also need to think about your hosts or nodes in your uh, cloud cluster that you deploy to. For example, the underlying Linux kernel might make a difference. As we'll, we'll see later, the, the Linux pseudo file system, for example, might be different on, the, on different nodes. The scheduler um, decides based on the resources that you give your containers on which nodes to schedule your containers on. So overall, we think it's different. And the goal of this talk today should be for you to be aware of the common gotchas when deploying to the cloud and to containers in the cloud, Java containers in the cloud, and make informed decisions. So how am I going to structure this talk? First, we will talk about Red Hat's OpenJDK images. And then we'll move on to OpenJDK container awareness what it means, why it's useful. Then we'll conclude with deploying to runtime images uh, and compiling your Quarkus-based applications to native and what benefits that has. So Red Hat's open JDK containers. You don't use the default open JDK image on Docker Hub, do you? Um, if you are, you might be running an up, unsupported up operating system, an unsupported uh, JDK build. It's a different build per tag. 
So you might get a different vendor depending on the tag. Overall, that image is deprecated. Be, please be mindful of that. Um, several um, communities upstream have run into that problem. It's a deprecated image. The image is only available still because it facilitates testing of early access builds of the latest JDK version, development version, um, currently to JDK 21. Uh, the full details are linked in this uh, blog post by Tim Ellison if you want to have a look. So this brings us to our, to the Red Hat Open JDK containers. They're not yet on Docker Hub, but they're available on the, on the Red Hat registry, available on the, the UBI EULA, and that's, you can freely redistribute those. And if you want to have the, the full support for them, you can, so you can use them for the, your upstream communities if you want. And those containers are built uh, with the OpenShift cloud deployment in mind. Those are builder images where you, which you can use to deploy your source, uh, your application source code to the cloud using that image without even touching a Docker file. Right now, uh, UBI 8 and UBI 9 are supported, um, the version listed. And um, those images also include certain optimizations already done that help you prevent certain gotchas that we will show in, in the later demos. So how do you tune our containers? There are very many environment variables that you can use to, uh, that, that you can set in uh, for those containers which affect build time or runtime. For example, we will show the Java opt append uh, environment variable in a demo later on, which is useful to set an additional property, something, something else you need to set for your application. And if you want to switch your uh, garbage collector, then GC container options is a useful environment variable to use for, for our containers. And the full documentation is linked here. And uh, you can, the, those link to JDK 11, uh, to, the, to the JDK 11 documentation, but the JDK 17 documentation is uh, forthcoming and very similar. That brings us to the next section of uh, this talk, which is Open JDK Container Awareness. Uh, what does it mean? By Open JDK Container Awareness, we mean that the upstream Open JDK has code in it that, when deployed to a container with resource limits, it detects it and then runs as if it was deployed on a physical system with those constraints. So in, in a way, the code upstream is modeled around that concept. It uh, got modeled around the Kubernetes use case where you have a container image that has the JDK inside. That container image gets a resource resource limit applied to by using a deployment config, for example, in OpenShift. That in turn results in specific settings on the Linux C group pseudofile system. And those settings will are then being used by the OpenJDK runtime to figure out uh, what its limits are. They're turned on by default, and you can turn it off using the presented switch using uh, xx minus use container support. And when you're deploying to OpenShift, for example, as mentioned before, the, the OpenJDK reads the Linux pseudo file system. And that file system tells it what the quota is and what's, what's ahead is it first figures out what Linux secret version is in use, actually. 
So for RHEL 8, the default C groups version is version one. For RHEL 9, the default version is C groups version two. And uh, the OpenJDK code handles that and figures it out and looks at the files. And then that results in OpenJDK resizing its internal structures as if it has the physical memory as specified by the C group quota. So how would you be able to observe what OpenJDK thinks that uh, the, its limits are? As we'll see in, a, in an upcoming demo, there is a VM info J command that's very handy to, to use and inspect on your live deployments. And it shows the C groups in, the, in its C group section what the container limits are. And it's basically the same information as presented in its uh, error log when you get crashes. And on the JDK side, there is a launcher switch called X show setting system, which shows the container limits as well. And when you're deploying in a container, the operating system MX bean is, has been made container aware and will present the container limits as well instead of the physical host it runs on. So what do you do when uh, container detection goes wrong? Um, for example, your, your deployment config is has a bug and the, the, the resources get not, do not populate to OpenJDK. You can turn on tracing for debugging your deployments and there are version specific switches that you can use to see a very verbose output, which files it looks at, what uh, underlying C groups version it detects and, um, and so on. Those switches are unlock diagnostic VM options, print container info, and for JDK 11, it's xlock OS plus container equals trace. Those are very handy. Uh, should you really run into trouble on, on your uh, container deployments using OpenJDK. So we'll also see it's useful for your containers to turn on basic, very unintrusive tracing for the garbage collector or algorithm. In your, in your uh, deployment logs, it's useful to know what GC algorithm OpenJDK actually selects. Um, why? We will see that later in a, in a demo as well, because it's not given that, that uh, the, the default collector gets selected. That brings us to the first demo where we look, build everything together. It's using the OpenJDK builder image based on UBI 9. It deploys the, a sample application that's hosted on GitHub, deploys it to OpenShift without touching a, a, a Docker file. And then uh, we'll see a common gotcha for uh, when, when uh, deploying it. Throughout our demo, we will be showing the same Carcass-based application deployed to OpenShift. It's using the UBI 9-based OpenJDK 17 image. The main piece of source code of the sample application is shown here. It's using rest endpoints and the hello greeting endpoint serializes the response as JSON, taking a sing single path parameter. When rendered in a browser, the application looks like this. When given an input, it'll render the response from the API endpoint that got taken from the JSON response. Moving on to the first demo, we'll show a memory config which isn't lending itself nicely to change container resource limits. The application got deployed as source build from the memory config bat branch of the Git repository where our application sources are hosted. The configuration uses the STY environment capability, which sets environment variables on the deployed pod after the build. This configuration sets minimum heap size and equal to maximum heap size and uses some other flags passed to the application at startup via Java Ops Append.
Looking at the deployed part on OpenShift, we see the same Java Ops Append environment variable showing up as we'd expect. Now, let's look at the configured container resource limits. We see CPU requests limits being set as well as memory requests limits. OpenJDK container awareness code takes CPU limits and memory limits into account. When inspecting the running JVM with VM info J command, we see in the C group section of the output its version of what it thinks the container limits are. As expected, CPU quota and period recognized as specified. Similarly, the hard memory limit recognized as one gigabyte. Let's look at the memory footprint of this deployed pod. It shows current RSS size as well as currently configured memory requests, orange dotted line, and currently configured hard limit, blue dotted line. We see the pod uses just above 560 megabytes of memory. Now, what will happen if we decreased the hard memory limit to 512 megabytes of memory? Once the pod tries to get redeployed, we immediately see it being killed due to an out-of-memory condition. So how could we correct such a situation? As shown next, we see the same app deployed again from the source build branch of memory config good. Comparing to the previous configuration, we see that nothing changed but our Java opt to pen values. In this case, we'll opt for a more elastic memory configuration. Removing hard-coded maximum and minimum heap sizes values and avoiding always pre-touch. Setting max RAM fraction instead, knowing that the builder image sets max RAM fraction to 80% for us. Looking at the resource limits config of this deployment, we see that we start out with a one gigabyte hard memory limit with 512 megabytes requests as before. Limits are again being recognized at the pod deployment level of OpenJDK. Now, if we change the memory limit of this deployment to 256 megabyte, the deployment succeeds and we no longer see out-of-memory kills. Looking at the deployed container, we see the updated memory limit detected at 256 megabytes. Nice! We've just decreased the net RSS footprint of this app from more than 500 megabytes to less than 100 megabytes of memory by adjusting some deployment parameters. To verify, the application still works as expected. So what are our key takeaways? For this application, we've seen that it, it 
actually matters what JVM flags you pass on for your deployments. It's actually fairly common for some older deployments to set uh, maximum heap size equals to the minimal heap, heap size, but uh, it might not be what you want when deploying to the cloud. Also be aware of the always pre-touch flag. And I also recommend using uh, elastic memory configurations for your heap size instead of uh, hard coding it uh, using absolute values because you can have uh, container awareness, take care of figuring out what the total container memory is and then base your heap size on that limit. And that adjusts uh, as you adjust your uh, container resource limits. Hey, Severin, uh, I wanna jump in. There's a question that came in that I think is appropriate to talk about now. You talked about how to edit and configure some of the resource limits. Yeah. If someone had asked a question um, specifically about if you have any guidance around CPU resource limits, uh, they had an example scenario where maybe there's issues with CPU detection and, and being single threaded when set to under a thousand core. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I think we'll we'll touch on on that on the on an upcoming demo. Um, so. For example, well, I, I don't want to give away too much from the demo, but uh, it depends on the resource limits that you set to what uh, what the what OpenJDK like. If you're going for your CPU quotas like millicores, if you're going below uh, a, a thousand millicores, then then that's that's one core. You you uh, the JVM will will use a, a single th thread and, and think it can only use a single thread. There is no way around that. Um, if you if you want to turn it off, you can turn it off, but it would then run as if uh, you uh, run on the host system, and you might want to configure active processor count, which is a JVM flag that can that you can use for explicitly setting the values that you want to. So um, uh, let's let's get back to this question after after the talk and, and see if there are still some some uh, uh, questions with regards to the CPU uh, limit specification, if that sounds all right. Sounds good, thanks. Okay, that brings us to the next section of this uh, talk. Let's talk about uh, deploying to runtime images and compiling your uh, Quarkus-based application to native. So, so far we've seen the builder image and working its magic to go from source code, application source code to a deployed container on OpenShift. So it clearly targets developer experience by getting fast feedback cycle, just to push to your Git repository and get it deployed on OpenShift automatically. And how would you be able to use that um, using the OpenJDK runtime image? So the builder images can, are full fat. They contain Maven. They have a Java compiler as part of it. Uh, they contain SY build scripts to do the magic to, to deploy the container without touching a Docker file. And um, the builder, Im uh, the runtime images only includes Java and, and the run JavaScript. And the, the, the convention we use for the runtime images is to have the minus uh, runtime suffix appended to the builder images. And the, the goal here is to have smaller or slimmer deployments, uh, slimmer in size, less dependencies installed, less attack surface. And that's what uh, customers have, have asked for. And, and we'll show how to use the builder image because it's not clear how to go from your application source code uh, to a deployment based on the runtime image uh, with an automatic setup. If you wanna recreate that setup, there is a link here and also in the attachment sections of this webinar. Um, first, it also uses the builder image and the application source code and compiles that and produces an intermediate image. 
and that includes Maven. And the, the secondary step is a multi-stage Docker build that transplants the, the binaries produced by the builder image from, from the intermediate image to a open JDK runtime based image that is used at deploy time, which we'll now show in the next demo. In the next demo, we show two things. One, deploying the application from source and then using an inline Docker build to deploy to the UBI9 runtime image. Two, when doing so, we show that garbage collection algorithm selection is an aspect that one should take into account. Looking at the OpenShift build configuration, we see the two stage builds as well as the Docker file of the inline Docker build. Since in this scenario, we deploy using the runtime image, we don't expect Maven to be pres present on the deploying container, which was in fact available when the application was built. Looking at the resource config of this deployment, we have arranged for two full cores and two gigabytes of memory being available to the deploying container. Looking at the logs of the deploying pod, we see via xlog gc config that G1 GC is being used. This deployment meets OpenJDK's internal server class requirement. Now, what happens if we decreased our resource allocations for deploying containers again? In this example, we decrease the memory allocation from 2 gigabytes to 1 gigabyte. The pod deploy successfully. Though, interestingly, serial GC gets selected. This is due to heuristics in OpenJDK, which uses G1, the default for JDK 11 plus deployments, only for server class machines. This precondition no longer holds with the updated deployment. Finally, if we change the deployment config to no longer override the DevOps environment variable, which we've artificially used for this demo to show GC algorithm behavior, we get the defaults specified in the inline Docker file of our run it, runtime image deployment. That inline Docker file configuration specifies parallel GC, and thus we see it being used. At Red Hat, we've had good experience for small JVMs with the provided config in this inline Docker file. It gives good memory footprint behavior by not having too adverse effects on CPU consumption. Okay, so I'm not sure, going back to the previous question, um, we've seen that OpenJDK internally has this concept of a, of a server class machine. And depending how you, you if you're running a, a plain OpenJDK image or our image or whatever you're specifying, it might depend on the resource limits, what, what garbage collector it selects. By default, the rule of thumb is, is if, if greater than two CPU cores and greater than two gigabytes of memory, then the default garbage collector gets selected. That's G1 for JDK 11 plus and parallel for JDK 8. Otherwise you get zero collector. And the way to get around this is to, to explicitly specify the garbage collector that you want. And um, we've seen as part of this demo that you can deploy to the runtime image using an automatic setup uh, going from source code to deploying on a runtime image-based uh, deployment. Well, a small caveat might be that you, depending on your inline Docker file that you might have to do some, some uh, manual juggling with the uh, CLI options of, of your Java command, depending on if you're using the run script or not. Okay, that brings us to the final section, which is 
Quarkus. Quarkus is a Quarkus is mission. It, it's a Java framework, right? With uh, developer joy in mind, and Quarkus ha has the mission of making Java again the, the preferred framework for Kubernetes native deployments, and it brings uh, a lot of extensions with it if you want to talk to a database or serialize JSON or um, do REST endpoints, all that good stuff is, is all included with Quarkus. But the, but the great thing about it is that you can run it in JVM mode and also AOT compile your Quarkus-based uh, Java application to native mode. And why would you want that? Because it gives superior startup time as we'll, we'll see in the, this final demo. The final demo demonstrates the difference in application startup time between JVM mode versus AOT compiled to native mode. Looking at the pod logs for JVM mode deployment, we see that the application is ready in about 1.3 seconds. In JVM mode, the deploying pod has Java installed. Comparing this to a pod that deploys the application to AOT compiled native mode, Java is not there. Only the native binary running the application is. Looking at the pod logs for native mode, we see that the application boots up in about three milliseconds. Very nice. If we inspect the memory footprint of the native app, we, get, we are still at less than 100 megabyte memory consumption with a current limit of one gigabyte. Decreasing the hard memory limit to 256 megabytes, similar to our good memory config in the first demo, we see the application still deploying fine. The app booting up in milliseconds and the application is still working as we'd expect. So this is a demo which basically shows, yeah, uh, when using Quarkus and Java, you can actually have comparable startup time again to Go applications. You can have very fast startup time, ideal for newly developed uh, microservices that yet you might have. And going native is included when using the Quarkus framework. The extensions that, that Quarkus comes with are tested with it and uh, you, can you can flip a switch and compile to native uh, when you're ready. Okay, that brings us uh, to the end of this talk. And we're, we have been talking about the Red Hat's OpenJDK containers and why you shouldn't be just using uh, any random uh, OpenJDK image and consider the security update cycle. For example, for OpenJDK, there are at least four security updates a year. You um, might want to have a rolling update for your containers on the cloud, and that's all possible using the OpenShift and, and source build approach. Then we have talked about um, OpenJDK container awareness and why it's important. It's important because you want to have uh, OpenJDK take care of its limits and, uh, and operate within those limits as specified in your uh, container deployments and don't go beyond those limits and get them uh, out of memory killed or uh, starved. And the final, final part of this talk was going to runtime images, what uh, there are common gotchas using the garbage collector uh, there is Quarkus, a great framework for newly developed apps and with superior startup time. And the, the key takeaways 
that I would like to have for you to take away is that you should think about the base image that you're using. Uh, it's part, basically you're shipping part of an operating system for every app, you, you, app you're shipping and don't randomly use any base image. Um, do specify container resource limits, request and limits. First, it helps the scheduler uh, for uh, placing your containers on, on a certain node. And second, it basically is the, the root of your good Java container-based deployment for container detection doing it, its thing and figuring out what its actual physical memory should be and, and sizing its internal structures accordingly. Um, don't rely on default container resource limit configuration in OpenShift. There might not be any. Uh, use elastic memory configuration switches such as max RAM percentage in your Java uh, containers. For example, when deploying to a container or when, when running OpenJDK on a physical system, the default for OpenJDK is to use about 25% uh, of the available memory for, for its own operation, for its heap size. So when you're, when you're uh, deploying to a container and you ha only have a single application in there, uh, you probably don't want to have it only have 25% uh, of the container limit used for uh, heap size. You probably want to want to use it 50% or 80% and the rest for native memory. Um, so use the max RAM percentage. The the Red Hat's OpenJDK images have those optimizations built in, um, and uh, don't set the the heap sizes in absolute terms. Try to refrain from. Uh, setting maximum heap size equal minimal heap size. If you're deploying to a public cloud and, and actually want to spend less memory, um, you might be surprised what's possible um, to run your applications efficiently uh, using fewer uh, bytes of memory. Then uh, don't use many applications in the same container. The containers are usually optimized for a single application, and otherwise they would compete with each other. Which, with each other, and uh, do employ limit ranges on OpenShift projects. For example, limit ranges is a default for uh, specifying container resource limits and deploy uh, container resource limits. So if you spe specify a limit range, you get uh, automatically a container resource limit applied if, if you don't do that. Um, then consider using Quarkus for a new application. It, it can have a very fast uh, startup time if compiled to native. It, we've, we've also had um, ex good experience with just running in JVM mode. Many customers use it um, just for JVM mode because Quarkus, uh, using Quarkus alone uh, makes their uh, applications boot up faster. Okay, uh, that concludes this talk. There's a slide with all the references if you want to have a look. And uh, this brings us to the uh, question and answer section of this webinar. And I hope you... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Severin. Um, what we'll Thanks, do Severin. is uh, we've got a bunch of questions that came in. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry about that. Uh, my audio is a little slow. Um, one of the questions I thought was pertinent to the last topic was how does cryostat or uh, Java flight recorder work for, um, I think it was talking about the native images, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> there is work uh, being done by our team that actually, um, like there is support in, in GraalVM for uh, flight recording in events and it's it's being expanded. So expect that to for, for you to work in an upcoming release uh, of, of uh, GraalVM and uh, Cryostat. All right, another one is how often are Red Hat OpenJDK container images updated? Is there a specific update schedule? 
Yes, uh, basically upstream OpenJDK does batched security updates. They are quarterly every, every January, July, April, July, and October, there is a security update and you can expect for the Red Hat packages or the images to get updates on at least those times of the year. And um, you, there, there might be features or other updates based on the base OS. Uh, so you can expect at least four updates, but there, they may be more frequent. All right. Um, another question is, what things can customers do to test the validity of their Java workloads that are deployed in the containers? And would the migration toolkit play a part of this? That's a good question. I'm not very familiar with what you mean by validity. Um, it's uh, I might have to defer that question to the to the uh, migrate MTA team. Uh, that's not part of our group, but um, uh, there is there are containers for uh, EAP, and um, there should be the same the same tooling available for running your EAP workloads in the cloud and the basic. The basic underneath OpenJDK workings are the same. You need to be careful of um, that the container uh, is running with a resource limit. Um, you might not run with a, with with it, and it might run on a host, depending on the on a big host, small host. Um, it, your application behaves different. So. Um, that's all I can say. I'm sorry, uh, not not super familiar with uh, uh, the EAP workloads and MTA. Okay. Um, next one. This is interesting. How would you manage your memory limits in the case of a multi-pod deployment? Uh, if you're if you're doing multi-pod deployment, the same the same uh, optimizations apply. So you're you're you optimize your pod like you have multiple pods deployed in that that comprise your full application and they talk together say using openshift services and but each single container or pod should have the, its uh, resources specified as as it, it needs it so um you can have the you, you need to figure out what what your specific pod does, what the what your needs are for 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 each specific pod, and then specify the limits for them, and and together uh, you can specify those limits as as your multi multi pod uh, deployment um, using, for example, a, a, a pre configured uh, OpenShift template that that's that that boots up your whole application, your all, all your pods. Uh, take a look at the demo um, that should work for many pods. You can scale that up uh, as you like. Um, one thing is someone had asked is, is there a way to recreate the demo that you did uh, in OpenShift? Yes, there is. Uh, I think I have uh, there in the attachment sections of this webinar, there are links to the, to the demo sources and that those have instructions how if if you have a, a open shift cluster you run those commands and you should be able to recreate uh, those demos on your cluster and play with it all right and last one this is might be a tough one to to finish on uh, what advice would you give to a customer who loves the stability that eap and vms has but is unsure what that would look like as you move to containerize, uh, con running containers on EAP, I'm assuming that means running containers on EAP on OpenShift. Is, I'm kind of reading between the lines there. Um, that's a tough one. You got, you got any ideas on that? Yeah, it's a good question. The the first question I would have is why would you think that an EAP deployment on on a, on the cloud or in a container is not stable so that that would be the first thing i would look into um, 
theoretically, if you if you take your on-premise deployment and have an equivalent uh, deployment in in your cloud, it should behave the same. Uh, if your if your uh, EAP pod is is configured correctly, uh, sometimes it's it's small things that make a huge difference, but Overall, I, I, that's where I'd start. Okay, uh, I think that's pretty much it for the questions that I can see, um, Severin. Um, quick comments um, from my end. I'm going to be closing the last poll. Um, also, appreciate if uh, you could vote and submit your feedback for any other ideas that we can uh, maybe perhaps talk on for future webinars. Um, other than that, um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Severin, for your presentation. I uh, really appreciate your time. And thank you to all of our partners who joined here today. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.